This week on Inside the Headset, we are featuring Louisiana Monroe's running backs coach, Tony Hole. In this episode, Coach Hole speaks on what it takes to turn a program around, details his unique experiences while coaching at Hawaii, and highlights the importance of putting players in positions to be successful. But first, a word from our partner. The All-State AFCA Good Works team has been one of the most esteemed honors in college football for more than 30 years. The student-athletes who are nominated for this award demonstrate a unique dedication to community service and desire to make a positive impact on the world around them. The Good Works team is comprised of 11 players from the FBS and 11 players from the FCS, Division II, III, and NAIA, as well as one honorary head coach. To be in consideration by Allstate and the AFCA for a nomination, each player must be actively involved with the charitable organization or service group while maintaining a strong academic standing. Past Good Works team members include notable players such as Peyton and Eli Manning, Tim Tebow, Trevor Lawrence, and Nicobe Dean. Coaches, do you have a player that you think embodies the values of a Good Works team? Be sure to connect with your SID to discuss potential nominees. Nomination forms have been sent out for the 2022 AFC Assistant Coach of the Year Award. To be eligible for this honor, a candidate must be an assistant coach at a four-year collegiate institution, have joined or renewed AFCA membership prior to the start of the 2022 football season, coach in a program that is not on major NCAA, NAIA, or conference probation, and make outstanding contributions in the area of community service, professional organization involvement, and student-athlete development, both on and off the field. Coach Hull, what's going on, man? How you doing? I'm good. How you doing, man? Yeah, man, I'm super excited about being on with you. I know uh, it's it's that time of the year where you're ripping and running and, and, and bouncing from hotel and high school to high school. So uh, I do appreciate you making a little bit of a time for us, man. How you doing? I appreciate you having me. Thank you for having me. Good. I'm excited about this. Good, man. Well, uh, first and foremost, I was kind of talking about it a little bit before the podcast, but uh, you're the running backs coach at ULM. Uh, that, I, I was the running backs coach at ULM back in 2015, receivers coach there um, uh, from 2012 to 20, 2014. So uh, definitely have cut my teeth at, at, at ULM, and I know you're a Louisiana native. So uh, first question, how does it feel just to be, be home, coaching college ball right there in, uh, in, in your home state? I mean, it, 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 feels, it feels amazing. It was, it was weird at first, you know, because I went from um, – Coach high school in Louisiana and never coached collegiately in right. Louisiana. I went to Kansas, Hawaii, and now I'm here. So my first practice on the practice field, I'm like, man, I'm not actually <laughs> coaching college ball right. in my home state. Like it was, it was a little awkward feeling at first, and then you know, the bit of euphoria, you felt great afterwards. Absolutely. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm surprised they're let you, letting you make it over there. I, I, I see you played at, at ULL, so I, I'm surprised they hadn't beat you up over there. <laughs> <laughs> they do a little bit after after the games, after we win. You know, they they, they sing the alma mater, the fight song, and I just you, know. <laughs> you just look away for a little bit. I got you. Man. <laughs> I have to draw the line somewhere, right? Somewhere. <laughs> well, that's good, man. Well, uh, you know. I want I want to take it back, right? You you kind of, you kind of really hit, you know, you've been in Kansas, Hawaii, at ULM, you're head coach of Warren Easton High School, but so let's rewind it back before you were actually coaching. Um you you you, you know, as after graduating from college, you were working in the engineering field, you know, including a couple of years at NASA. Uh, you know, what was that like? And then what what prompted you to get into the to the coaching field? It it was the most uh liberating um, feeling job I've probably ever had in my professional career. Um, just to be able to work with so many bright minds, yeah. to learn so many great ideas on not just engineering theories and practices, but leadership and, 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 and you know, organizational building and, and motivating individuals, I you know it just it was it was a phenomenal experience. It was something that I that I cherish and I carry over you know into into the football world. Um, what wanted me to get into football was that you know I believe coaching is not a is not a job; it's a passion. You know, and while working in this great job and this great organization, I still had the hunger and the desire to coach and lead young men. 
And that's the reason why I got back and got into football is because I wanted to develop a lead young man. That's uh, that's awesome when you kind of identify some of the some of the things that you got from working in that field. You 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 said leadership and and, and uh, you know molding and things like that. And so it sounds like you were able to apply some of the, some of this as a coach, and you continue to apply some of this. And, and it might have gave you a little head start on on, on being a coach with you know schematic being such a small part of it. This is so much more about leadership. Yeah. So much more about you know all all these other things leading young men, especially as you transition straight into a high school role, right? Yep, it was you know it it wasn't so much that the X's and O's part was like it's total separate, you know. Yeah. Um, but the 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 organizational structure right. and how to lead peers and how to motivate peers and how to go out and find uh, personnel to fit, which is that's all of the all of the practices that I applied at Warren Eastern High School Absolutely. You know, as, a, as the head coach allowed me to use a lot of the tools that I, I received from NASA and the lessons I learned and apply it to my own organization. Because when you're head coach, it's your own, your, it's your own entity, your own organization. So to take those, uh, those methods and those practices and those philosophies from all of the great leaders uh, and allow me to apply it at Warren Eastern and, and build something special um, and then the X's and O's part took care of itself uh, uh, based off of my football knowledge. Right, um, right. Another another thing about working at NASA that was great is that, you know, you always hear guys say, oh, I learned this system from such and such because I worked with such and such and all of those things, right? Yeah. The beauty about college football is that your, your library is there. You got film from any place, anytime, anywhere, right? It's a it's a, it's the the mecca of football libraries, right? Well, uh, a lot of engineering principles teaches you how to observe and learn systems, right? So I can take those principles and apply it to film watching. So I don't have to work for Lincoln Riley to understand and learn his system, right? I know what it takes to observe, uh, 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 to observe and, and take intricate notes learn the system without even having that question. Oh, yeah, that, I mean, there's got to be some beauty in that in terms of, like, you know, you kind of use it from an offensive development standpoint. But even from, a, you know, sitting in the – sitting getting, preparing for playing ULL, you know, you're sitting there, what are they trying to accomplish here on third, third and four? You know, what coverage can we expect? And you start to see patterns and, you know, just stuff like that you probably – are just so used to doing in that engineering field, in that engineering background, seeing those patterns, which can be super helpful for game planning. Now, you you, you may mention Warren Easton, and uh, you know, once again, I thought we both we both kind of hit the nail on the head in terms of schematics. I mean, you see teams, especially when you go to state championships there in Louisiana or in Texas, or whatever. And you, one team's running triple option, one team's five wide. On the, it's not about the scheme. It, the, the commonalities are the stuff that's outside of the lines, right? And those are where you, you find more of your commonalities. And so you walk into Warren Easton. Uh, it's a program that hadn't seen much success back in 2005. And, uh, you know, I, I can even recall back, you know, I was at ULM. And, I mean, that was a, that was a top-tier top program. And so uh, what was your approach in turning that program around that had so much uh, – uh, lack of success in in the history. I mean, what were some of the some of the tactics that you took? Because that's that's a different that's a different type of program. Well, the first thing I did was I had to go out and identify uh, individuals uh, that supported what we wanted to um, embrace at Warren East, the uh, coaching staff, the people around the coaching staff. Um, one of the things that we did was majority of our coaches had never coached um, high school football before, right? I never coached before in their life, but my number one standard, which is different, you know, it's different from other people, was you had to have an abnormal love for players, right? You have to love, you have to love them on and off the field, and then I can teach you how to coach, right? So I identified individuals who who love players um, unconditionally, and then we took that approach. And the second approach, I heard one of our program directors. Uh, you should say all the time, I want this organization to run when I'm long, long, long and long. I want it to be able to run when I'm not around. I want it to be able to run when X, Y, and Z is missing, out sick or whatever. And so we took that approach to where it wasn't a dictatorship. I empowered the people around me. I taught them. Um, we, we, we bounced ideas off of each other. 
And we wanted that thing to run without any one particular person at the head. And as a lot of people can see, it's still running at a high level. Right. Well, let, let me ask you this. Um, you know, oftentimes you you take over a high school program and you don't have that leniency that you do in college in regards to personnel because some of these guys are signed into contracts via via the school. You know, I, mean? hey, I'm, I teach social studies mm-hmm. here, so – uh, you can't fire me because I'm more signed to the contract with the school. You know, so you, you, how how were you able to kind of ha- have a little bit more control over over your coaching staff? You know what I mean in, in regards to to some of that. My brother's a, a Texas high school football coach, and so he like when he took his his first job, it was like you can hire three people. The other eight are the guys that were already on the staff that you got to just deal with. So you know, how, how how were you able to manage that? Uh, basically, uh, through it through through relationship building. Okay. Um, I think that's a major key that I took from my previous job. You have so many individuals of so many other disciplines that goes that go into this overall project. Right. You got welders who don't really care what the phone people do. They don't have no idea about it. They don't care. Yeah. But you get things you understand how your small part plays into the overall scope of things. And how you you being the best that you can be at this small part and this guy being the best at this small part can overall affect the whole program. So I think when you got a situation where guys, you know, you have to take these eight guys on, you find out who they are as a person, right? Yeah. You find out what makes them tick. You find out what their dreams and aspirations are. And then you take those dreams and aspirations and what makes them tick and make them see how, a, you know, buying into this system will help you attain that. Absolutely. I think where a lot of guys go wrong is it's either my way or the highway, right? And guys get guys get upset about that, and they and they're, they're 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 reluctant to buy in. Yeah. So if you can take that personal dreams and aspiration, right, and tie that into you know the overall program success. I think that you get more buy in. People, you know, people are individuals. They right. want to know that you care about them. They want to know that you have their best interest at heart, and what I feel is that once you once they realize that, they'll 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 run through walls. That's right, man. I, I love that you identified that. I mean, uh, it, it's, uh, oftentimes, and in, in, you know, I'm talking about this with with this unique position of, of taking a head high school role on. I mean, but this is the same thing when you're a, a college program and you come in and it's. Uh, you got these old college athletes uh, from from the previous staff, and and if you don't embrace them, they always feel like, oh, these are the new guys. They don't like me, or you know, and, and, and it never comes to fruition. And those guys that come in, like you said, and, and build those relationships and rapport, like it, it just ends up being seamless. So I love that you identified that. Now let's talk about uh, your stop in in Hawaii, okay? Because uh, I, I'm, you know what, I, I think we had a Hawaii coach on at one point in time, but I I, I didn't ask this, and I kind of regret asking it because Hawaii is a unique deal, right? Uh, I had the opportunity yeah. to go out there and, and, and play a, a regular season game, and it was just such a I – mean, we, we flew out three, four, three or four days early, you know what I mean, and it was hard to fly back. And, you know, when we were playing, it was really 2 a.m. in Louisiana. I was at ULM at the time. And, and so all, you had all these really weird thing, dynamics going on when you play out there. But if you're coaching in Hawaii, this is every week for you where – travel is a little different, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, talk to us a little bit about what it's like to be on those islands on a weekend and week out basis in the season regarding to, you know, traveling, how you prepare for games, knowing guys are coming in, kind of trying to get acclimated to that time, uh, that jet lag, uh, the time movement, and also recruiting uh, because I'm sure that plays a plays a unique role as well. Well, the, the recruiting aspect, uh, I was out there doing COVID. So we weren't uh, doing official visits. Okay. Yeah, we weren't really traveling per se. Uh, but you just kind of heard the stories of, of, about it. You right. know, um, I think one of the unique things they do at the university is that, you know, they they don't fly out um, because it's so expensive. Unless they really think they got a really good shot at you signing with them and yeah. you have a really good feel, they, they don't bring you out on official visits. I think that's smart. You know what I mean? They're just not – they're not bringing guys out on the hope, right? Yeah. They, they realize that, you know, we, we, we're a favorite to get this guy. Let's, let's finish the deal. Um, the University of Hawaii itself is a phenomenal institution. Like the, the, the people that work in athletics, the people that work in the university, they love the university. 
they love the island. What I love about uh, the island is that they treat everyone with respect. You know, they have they go about they go about their business in a kind-hearted, sincere way, um, and they look after one another. Um, but when it comes to the the logistics, I think that as an athletic department, they do a great job to use it for their advantage. You know what I mean? So you, you all of those things you talked about, the time difference and the and the coming out there early. They do a great job of using that to advantage. And what I mean by that, I just give you a couple of examples, right? They they assist teams with wanting to get on the, as much beach, beach access as they want, you know, because they're being hospitable. Hey, we can, you know, facilitate this, but they know your kids are spending a ton of time in the sun. So yeah. two days from now, right? Yeah. So you want out. Yeah. One of the, here's another thing I thought was really, really cool, right? So our kids used to get there early to the stadium. You know, the kids have uh, NBA Young Boy and, 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 and 50 Cent and, and, and Lil Wayne playing in the yeah. stadium while they warm it up. And as soon as the visiting team walks in the stadium, it's all luau music. Uh-huh. All soothing, luau. <laughs> <laughs> so, so guys used to walk up to them like, Coach, how, y'all, how do y'all get off of the game? <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, Coach, the kids just do it, but in the back of my mind, I'm like, you just don't know. We didn't already, we didn't already set the tone before you even got there, right? So they, you know, Hawaii does a great job of doing things like that to create the environment that they want to create. Right. I, 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 I use the analogy. They lure you to sleep and then they bite your head off and yeah. you go over and kick off. You know, it's just real tactful and real, we're real smart, to be honest. Absolutely. I, I, you know, talking about the recruiting deal, I think that's, uh, that's very unique. I mean, because, you know, a lot of times you want to – you got two or three guys that, you know, you want to bring in and, let's say, running back. And, and uh, you know, you feel good about – we feel really good about one, the other two are close. But it sounds like it, you wouldn't bring those other two in. It would just be that one because you, you're just basically not trying to get free vacations to guys. Because, you know, let's, let's be real. I mean, a high school guy would just straight up say, yeah, I'm, I'm probably going to go to, you know, Arkansas, but let me get, you get this little three-day weekend in Hawaii for free and – uh no, nope. so you're trying nope. to trying to negate that a little bit. Exactly, exactly. You know, and, and just they they don't they, they do a great job of understanding where they're at and the caliber of player that they need to recruit and get on the island to be yep. successful, and not waste their time um, um, trying to trying to stretch above their means. Well, I, you know, let, let me ask you this last thing about about recruiting in Hawaii, and then we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about where you're at currently. Um, yeah, and, and and I know you didn't get the opportunity to hop out and get on the road there, couldn't do the COVID. But um, you know, one of the things I always found interesting was I would, I, if I was in Dallas, I'd find a kid that was going to Hawaii. I, mean, I lived down here in Waco. You had a really good receiver that was from Waco, La Vega, uh, over the last couple of years. Um, I was in Louisiana. I was I was recruiting Mississippi and I got beat out on <laughs> beat out by Hawaii on a kid from Mississippi. So it it just kind of seems like it's uh you know for a school that is relatively tight on its recruiting budget and things like that. You know from what I've heard, they they do manage to get out and and, and they do some national recruiting to a certain extent. Is that accurate? That's correct. I actually signed two kids from New Orleans to okay. Hawaii before I left. The uh, uh, defensive end, he was the he he has the sack record in the state of Louisiana. He's not. He, and I forgot how many sacks he had for the year, but got him to sign with the line. I got a linebacker, um, a three-star linebacker who was offered by uh, a couple of, uh, more than a handful of uh, of, uh, mid-major schools to come to Hawaii. So, you know, they they do a great job recruiting nationally, but again, they they have a great identity who they are. Right. They have a great identity of what type of kids can have success there and what type of kids they need there. Um, and they go out and they pinpoint those particular individuals and they go get them. That's right. That's right. Well, now let's, uh, let's transition in, uh, to, to ULM. Now, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm just going to ref- talk about my time here just, just a little bit, but it's more, more a story. I was talking to, you know, Obviously, in my role, I get to talk to coaches, and I was, we were talking some ball, man. I was like, yeah, you know, when we were playing Arkansas, we did this. Yeah, you know, we were playing LSU, blah, blah, blah. You know, when we were playing uh, Alabama, we did that. 
And then the guy stops and he's like, oh, I didn't know you coached in the SEC. I was like, no, nah, I, I just coached at ULM. And so uh, <laughs> one of the unique things about ULM was that uh, we, we were like the baby SEC conference because uh, money games are important there. Uh, you know, the budget's, budget's relatively tight. It's one of the um, – you know, one of the group of fives that are heavily relying on money games. And so, thusly, you, you end up playing a ton of, you know, where, where, where most teams play one money game. You might have a, a season with two money games. Um, you know, how, how do you use that, number one, to generate an underdog mentality with your student athletes? And, I, you know, like I said, I, I can speak on the experience from my, from my personal self. And then how you use it in recruiting to help motivate guys to come in and, and play, knowing that, hey, you're going you're gonna to play some SEC and Big, Big 12 and ACC schools year in and year out. Uh, it's a let's rewind to my time at Kansas, right? Okay. When I was at Kansas, you know, Kansas usually um is not finishing in the top half of the conference in overall win. Right. Uh, one of the beautiful things about Kansas, uh, our starter and our backup is currently on NFL rock. That's unheard of at the University of Kansas. So yeah. what I used to do, because you gotta play the Oklahoma, the Baylors, the you know, the uh, Oklahoma State, the Texas, right? right. Uh, we used to study each starting running back at those different universities to give them an idea of, okay, here's what they look like, right? And then our going into the summertime, our focus was we want to be the best performing group in the conference, right? Throughout everything else, with the rest of the team, correct? Mm -hmm. Every year we finished in the top three or four as a position group in the Big 12. So you carry that over into where we're at now, yeah. right? Our standard for this year, we are playing uh, Alabama, we play Texas, we have Army. You know what I mean? So guys are like, Rich cracked the joke last year, Rich Rodriguez, he went to the AD and was like, so the Green Bay Packers want to be able to, right? <laughs> right. It's kind, of, kind of like the joke, right? Okay. But so our focus this offseason, right, is, okay, what does Texas look like as a running back? What does Alabama look like? Here's the standard. Here's what they do. Now let's go in with the mindset this summer of we want to outperform them, right? We focus. I'm not well, – we're not going to focus on the overall goal of wins and losses, right? right. If you focus on the goal – you're never going to get the good habits, like the, the book from Atomic Habits, right? Yeah. Create the process, create a process-driven environment, not a goal-driven environment. Yeah. So my job is to get them to understand, right, the process this summer, is th this is what the process needs to look like in order to be successful when the fall comes playing against those major giants. Because a lot of coaches go, oh, well, it's just another game. I think that's total, like, BS, yeah. right? Um, there's a difference between playing in front of 15,000 and 150,000, right? right? Um, there's a difference between playing uh, a guy that's going to go work for a bank when he graduates as opposed to a guy that's going to be a first-round draft pick when he graduates, no right? Question. So I think that you have to accept that situation and you have to create a process in the summertime and keep them focused on the process as opposed to the goal. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, let me ask you this question. And, uh, you, you know, you the reality of it is, is you're most likely going to get two of those type of games at, at ULM. Once again, this is this is unique to, to, to ULM. And, you know, six and six, I've, I've, I've been there. I've been six and six at ULM. It's not enough. It's not enough bowl games to get you. It's not enough tie ins to get you into a bowl game at six and six there. Uh, so a lot of times you, you got to go win one of those. You, you're going to have to go. And if you want to go play in a bowl game, if you want to. Win that conference, you have to be able to go show up and, and, and win some non-conference games in that league. And so, uh, we're, we're, like you said, uh, you know, it's very easy to say, oh, we're playing Bama. You know, they'll beat us and we'll, we'll just move on. Um, you know, how, how, how do you kind of kind of get that mentality? I know you kind of dissected that just a little bit, maybe more from a team standpoint. You know, uh, you know, Coach Bowden, you know, what do you guys talk about heading it? When you're about to run out that tunnel and, and, and the number one team in the country is on the other side of that field, uh, you know, what's, what's, what's some of the things that go in that locker room? The one thing that, that I can only control my group um, and speak for my group. So the one thing I tell my group is to control what we can control, yeah. right? Like, for instance, going into the LSU game last year, we're, 
where we, we could have won it. We're in a position to win that thing, right? Mm-hmm. And one of the things we focused on, because I coached out, outside receivers there, one of the things we focused on is that uh, whenever we won the one-on-one ball, 15 yards or more, right, we scored 100% of the time, right? So that was my major focus was, number one was being excellent blockers, right, finishing our block, finishing between the defender and the ball carrier. Number two was we had to go in that thing and win the one-on-one ball, uh, you know, uh, and we were, I think we won 80% of those in the game, which I thought we did our part to help contribute to putting ourselves in a position to win the game. That's you can tell us you. That's entire stadium, Death Valley, Saturday night, where dreams go to die and all that other stuff, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. Well, we put ourselves in a position to make their dreams die, right? So I think that's like, so going into this year, right, We're going. I'm going to focus on what does it take for the group I'm in charge of to put us in a position to be successful, and I'm going to harp on those things throughout the process, throughout the the, the river uh, throughout the duration of the time before it's time to actually touch the field. And right before we touch the field, I'm going to remind them of what it takes to put us in a position to win again. I love that, man. Yeah, process, yeah, focusing on the process over the end goal. That's, I, I absolutely love that. Now, uh, you know, there are 130, 130, a little over 130 FBS football programs in the country. And, you know, in this last season, ULM was the least penalized team in the country with only 3.67 penalties per game. How, that, you know, that doesn't happen by accident. Uh, you know, obviously discipline is, is, is something that's important. And I, I, I know as a running back's coach, your role is uh, – your role is a part of it, but you know the penalties tend to tend to lie in a lot of other places than than just running backs. But you know, what's that overall goal from a team? Uh, you know, how how did you get such a disciplined team to to show up on Saturdays? Because that gives you an opportunity to win when you're when you're not you know, shooting yourself in the foot. You know, I throughout my coaching career, I had coaches say no penalties, no penalties. I don't have you had you got the goal chart, but uh, three three penalties or less. Or yeah. It's just a bunch of different tactics that I heard that, you know, they didn't really stick with me. They kind of hovered in yeah. my brain, but didn't stick in there until I until I started working with Rich Early. His, his was Rich philosophy, and I thought it was phenomenal. Him and Zach did a great job. Rich used to always say, you got to know your personnel. Know your personnel. Know your personnel. And so I took it a step further. I was like, all right, Cookie, what do you mean by that? He goes, Tony, you have to know what they can and cannot do. Because if you put them in a position to try to do something that they've proven they cannot do, they're either A, going to be out of position and not going to execute, or B, be out of position and cause a penalty. Right. And I thought about that and I was like, wow, he was like, our job as the coaches is to know what they cannot do and never put them in that position. Because when you ask the guy to do something, he's proven he can't do He's not going to do it, or he's going to cause a penalty while doing it. And I think him and Zach Alley did a great job of putting our kids in position to play fast, but also not uh, basically not uh, have penalties. If that makes sense. Absolutely, you know that's that's fantastic. I mean, I think that I think that's huge. And uh, you know, it's, it's funny you you kind of hit on that being such an emphasis in, in, in football. And I remember uh, you know, we one of the places I was at, we were having this big debate on, hey, what, what are we going to hang our hat on? What are, you know, what statistics are we going to hang our hat on? And, uh, um, you know, I, I was like, you know, I'm, I'm going to dive into this a little bit. And so, I, you know, I, I pulled up all the NCAA stats and, you know, broke them all down. I said, you know what? The, you know, the, the three teams that were in the top 25 this year, Man, they were in the top five in, in penalties. Like maybe this thing isn't that important. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And uh, yeah. and I said that to my head coach. He was like, "That's but those penalties. That's the stuff that gets me fired. So we're not going to go out there and do that." And so I, you know, we kind of got a good laugh off of it. But it, it is it is something that does give you a, an advantage. You know, it's it's a momentum killer. It's a uh, you no. Know, sometimes it can flip the field. You know, in a special teams yeah. game. So it is important to be be locked in on that. So congratulations on that and continue to build on that, Coach. It's been my pleasure, man. I do have to ask you this before we hop off. What is your favorite spot, sure. to eat? especially growing up in New Orleans? Because you know the that real Louisiana food. What's your favorite spot to eat in in in, in Monroe, Louisiana, man? Oh, Monroe. That's the uh, crawfish city. Crawfish City is, I, you know, you when you leave outside, you hear crawfish being cooked New Orleans style, right? Yeah. New Orleans has a particular way of making crawfish, right? So 
when you go outside the city of New Orleans, you're very uh, leery about eating crawfish, right? Because right. you know it's not cooked for well, New Orleans style. <laughs> but there's a place in one road called Crawfish City, and oh my God, it's amazing. Yes, they sir. <laughs> that's a good answer man well hey once again i appreciate you especially been on the road man i know how how hectic it can be trying to bounce around get everywhere you need to get and so thanks for taking some time with us man and uh look forward to keeping up with you guys this upcoming season best of luck to you coach thank you i appreciate everything you should have me on all right thanks for listening to this week's episode of inside the headset if you heard anything on this episode that you would like to learn more information about head over to afcapodcast.com where you can find every episode and all of the corresponding show notes. While you're there, take a second to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for the show, please let us know by sending an email to podcast at afca.com. Make sure to follow the podcast on Twitter at Inside the Headset and tag it when you share each episode. You can stay up to date with all things AFCA by following the at We Are AFCA Twitter account. Every episode of Inside the Headset can also be found on your favorite audio streaming platform, such as Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. If you are not currently a member of the AFCA, be sure to find us online at AFCA.com and apply to join over 10,000 NFL, college, and high school coaches from around the country who are striving to be the best they can be. With an AFCA membership, you gain invaluable access to the annual AFCA convention, the bi-monthly magazine, and the new and improved digital library, which contains thousands of videos and articles contributed by hundreds of current and former football coaches. You can also visit AFCAinsider.com to sign up for our free weekly email newsletter on the right-hand side of the screen. It comes out every Tuesday at lunch and is filled with great articles and stories written by many of the same coaches you hear on the podcast. It's geared to help you become a better coach tomorrow than you are today. Be sure to connect with me on Twitter at Coach Mario Price. And remember, the AFCA is not just an annual convention. It is an association that continually promotes education, guidance, and networking. But it is also so much more than that. The AFCA is about celebrating the past and educating the future. It is about developing great coaches who will produce great teams and even better people. So invest in your skill set and impact today by engaging with the AFCA.